G'day everyone, welcome back to the art room. Today I'm going to explain what I call an inside outside painting. So our inside outside painting is basically where we're going to use an acrylic medium, which is a paint, and we're going to put, draw an animal, and it has a pattern, and the pattern is actually going to go on the outside of the animal, and the environment that the animal lives in is going to go on the inside. So again, the pattern of the animal will eventually be on the outside and the environment that it lives in will be on the inside. So we've got a few steps to get through before we get to painting our actual piece. So the first thing we're going to do is in a page in your sketchbook, I'd like you to draw three animals with an environment and it needs to have a pattern. So if you decide to draw a wombat, Guess what? A wombat doesn't really have a pattern in its um, out, out on the outside of it, so it's not something that I'd suggest you draw. So if we were thinking of animals with a pattern, we would normally brainstorm this in the room. We would come up with, say, a zebra, a giraffe, um, butterflies, fishes, snakes and so on. So it's thinking of an animal that has a pattern. And I know I've said it a few times, but you really need to concentrate on that. Now let's say we have our sketchbook. We normally have A3 sketchbooks in the art room. You need to draw the animal and its environment. So it's like doing a study of your work, like an artist would if they were outside, and then you're gonna use this information to create your piece. Now, if this is an A3 paper, we don't need an animal here, an animal here, and another animal here. It doesn't help you with what you're doing. So if you want to, I would like you to um, draw your animals and draw some of their patterns, and then you could draw the environments that they live in. So my butterfly is going to be surrounded by flowers, that's flower, and so on. So how many of these are you going to draw on this piece of paper? Three. Okay, and I'll show you some examples. So here I've got some examples of what some students have had a play with. Um, they've drawn their animal and it's got a lovely pattern and then they've drawn some of their environment. I actually really love the little lines. They're very characteristic on this piece. We've gone over to another one. We've got a giraffe with its pattern and some of its environment, a turtle with its pattern and some of its environment, another fish, but they haven't got quite got their environment ready, a giraffe and a turtle again, seeming popular, a bird and I think that's a baboon with some of that's environment. So that's some lovely detail in there. And we've got a What's that animal called that changes color in its environment, uh, changes its pattern? A chameleon, that's right, a chameleon. A chameleon in this one. So this is a lovely study for a chameleon. Now this person's actually taken it a little bit further. They've actually drawn the chameleon with their environment on the inside. So that's a great way to think about the composition. And we'll talk about the composition in a sec. One of the things students do is they struggle to get, come up with ideas. So if your student has a device, they're very welcome to get online and find a picture, the picture that has of an animal that has a pattern, and then they can use that as a reference to create their drawings. So this person has got their giraffe and they're doing their sketching and they've started to have a go at playing with their pattern. Now, because you're creating a rough piece of work, um, you don't need to do the whole giraffe, okay? Because that takes up a lot of time. So what I'd really like students to do is they do enough work so they get information on how to do a particular section. And then I would say to this person, okay, so you have, have an idea of how you want your giraffe pattern to look, great. Could you please start on your environment? So then you can take that information and um, add that to your work. Now that you've had a think about doing the animals with a pattern, the next step for us would be to play with the medium. Now what I mean by playing with the medium is you want to have a think about what colours you're going to use, how you're going to apply the paint, and with what you're going to apply the paint with. So if you have a, a feather, 
you know, just putting a slab of a color down, it doesn't really capture the, the texture and the essence of your animal. So before you start your good copy, you really want to have a play. So this is where I'm suggesting you get different types of brushes and you use different colors to make your piece. So even though you might have an orange in your uh, color palette that you can use, think about getting your red and yellow, red and yellow make orange, and you can get some different tonal um, values with your orange that way. You, you've also got your orange from your, um, from your tube or whatever you have your paints in. You can add a little bit of red to that or a little bit of yellow to that. The red would make it a little bit darker and the yellow would make it a little bit lighter. So really, you know, there's even times when I say when we're doing a painting, you are not allowed to use paint straight out of the tube. You have to mix your colors. So that gives you a little bit of a push. So feel free to take that on if you want to have a go. Now, you need to have a go at painting an animal itself and you need to have a go at painting its environment. It's like practicing before you, you know, go and play a game of basketball. You train yourself. So this is having a go at how to do that. There's no point starting on a good piece of paper and going, oh, that's really not working. It still happens. But the idea of the experimenting with your medium, your trialing, is to have a go at practicing what you're doing before you start. Trialing is the next part of coming up with your inside outside painting. So it's here where you have a go at working out what you want to paint. And these are some examples. And it'll be great if I can find that finished one. Here we've got their little Nemo fish, and then they've had a go at thinking of those colors. Now it's fine to do your color study with the pattern on their inside, but remember for the piece, this piece's pattern is actually going to go on the outside. So you've got to remember that. Now this person has come up with uh, some striped and dotted animals. And then what they've done is they've had a play at coming up with the pattern for the animal. So this is a great sort of trial, but it's a lot of space that I've covered doing the same thing. So instead of doing the same thing for each of those spots, trying something different for each of those would have been a better idea and incorporating what the background would have looked like as well. So here we're up to another stage where we've grabbed an A2 piece of paper. So you can see how big this is. If you have A2 paper, that's great, but not a lot of people will. So if you take A3 paper, one, two and paste them together you'll come up with an a2 piece of paper see how you go for your paper and the size and how much paint you have so the first thing i usually get students to do is i put a border around the paper we usually use a ruler and that's about three centimeters the reason i get students in a classroom to put the border on is when they're painting i want them to paint up to their edge if they paint up to the edge of the paper it usually goes everywhere all over the table even though we use newspaper underneath, it's still neater for students to put um, a border in. And sometimes what happens is students actually paint something outside the border, and I love it when they think outside the square. So it allows for a little bit of play if they want to do it. Okay, now we've got a large piece of paper. It's a large piece of paper. There is no point doing a drawing of a scrub of fish from somebody this big. Art teacher version of a fish. What are you gonna put in the rest of the painting? So think about your composition. Composition would be your word for the day. So you need to think about where your, if you're doing a fish with a pattern, where that's going to go. So if I have my fish in here, doing it quickly for you to see the demonstration. Detail. Okay, I'd probably give him a bigger tummy or maybe a smaller tail. Now you get the idea. What we'll do then is once you're happy with your composition, I would encourage you to outline your piece. Oh, I missed the little fin on there, but that's okay, you can get dropped off. And then what happens is you need to put the pattern on the outside and the environment on the inside. But we'll do that a little, beta, a little bit later. What I am going to explain is the next part of the process. It's creating a wash to go behind your work. Now a wash is where you put a little bit of paint with a lot of water and you use that to cover your area. But we're going to go a step further. You need to create a complementary wash underneath your actual shape. Can I concentrate? So, you are going to create a basic color wheel, red, 
blue and yellow. Can you tell me what colour scheme that is? It's primary. These are your primary colours. If you add your red and blue together, you're going to get purple. If you add yellow and blue together, you're going to get green. And I can hear you saying if I add red and yellow together, you're going to get orange. I heard you saying that. Well done. Okay. So you're going to add a complementary colour scheme. Now, a complementary colour scheme is colours that are opposite each other on the colour wheel and they're to complement each other. So red is supposed to complement green, yellow complements purple, and orange complements blue. Now, what goes on the inside here? It's the environment. So for example, if our environment is our fish and our fish lives in the water, our complementary wash that's going to go in here is going to be orange. Okay, now the next one is, if we have the stripy orange fish that's going to go on the outside, the complementary color for orange is blue. So we're going to put blue, a blue wash on the outside. Does that make sense to people? So let's say, for example, I was doing a giraffe. Oh, and think about what um, way you want to do your paper. Do you want to have it landscape or do you want to have a portrait? So this is my giraffe. You like my picture of a giraffe? Now, the giraffe colour scheme is sort of browns, etc. And if I was making a brown, I'd use a little bit of everything. So a brown is a little bit harder to put together. So if I was doing the complementary colour for a brown for a giraffe, I'd think about what I was trying to get. And I would probably put an orange in the background. And then you're going to put your browns and your tans over the top of that. Now, if you're going to put your complementary colour for your environment, uh, you could put you might have a lot of sky with a little bit of green. Now your sky color is a blue, so your complementary color is a um, orange. So but you don't want the same sort of coloring. So I would make this orange a bit darker and this orange a little bit lighter. Now again, if you wanted to make your orange darker, you want to use maybe a red, don't use black. And then if you want to make it that one a little bit lighter, you'd add a little bit more yellow. Um, not white. So that's probably what I would do for that sort of animal. So go back to your colour wheel and this is a complementary colour scheme and you've got to have a go at remembering that one. Okay, I've just grabbed a little bit of paint and you only need a little bit of paint and we're going to create a wash. Very technical. A wash is paint oh i don't even need that much and water so you can create a wash like so just gonna oh that's nice okay so i'm going to create my wash and it is as simple as that now because we're using a paper that's 125 gsm if you um, work continually over the one spot your paper will do what's called burring I'll see if I can get it to burr oh okay there it is straight away so what this is doing is this is lifting up the pulp of the paper and you don't want to do that so I want to put it on and leave it alone now you're going to paint over this and I can hear you saying Mrs Herbert how come we're putting this color down and then we're actually going to paint over it when I do my paintings, not all of them, but some of them, I actually put a wash down on my surface. And what that does is it really gets rid of the white bareness of a piece of paper or a canvas, whatever I'm working on. So, and then you're going to paint over the top. And if you leave little flicks of this wash to go through it, it looks great. Now, how long did that take me? Not very long. So that's how you create your wash. And I'm also going to show you what I was talking about with your orange wash. So I'm going to use some clean water. Do I have clean water? Yep. Over here. Now I've got orange and I've got yellow and I've got red. So if I want to make my wash a little bit darker, I would add red. If I want to make it a little bit lighter, I would add a yellow. 
not black and white. Stick with the red and the yellow. Now, the next one is, ooh, that's nice. Now I'm gonna make it a little bit darker and it's the same process. You have paint with your water and you're creating a complementary wash in the back of your animal. Now that won't take very long to dry, but you do have to let it dry. Might need a little bit more. So that's as scary as a wash is. Remember, it needs to be complementary, and you might have 50 colors, but just choose one wash, and then that will help push and pull the colors and the marks and the textures that you create out of your paper. So we've gone through lots of those stages. We've gone through sketching, we've gone through um, trialing with your mediums, we've gone through thinking about your composition for your piece, and we've done a wash. So I'm gonna show you some examples of what some of the students could come up with. So this one here, they have uh, got their turtle and they've put the pattern for the turtle on the outside and then they've started to put the environment on the inside. So it's really important, try not to get too confused. This. It works out really well. And this one is a butterfly. Again, you don't have to be so tight with your work, but lots of people can be. So this person's really had a play with doing different tones and different marks to create the pattern of butterfly. And then they've put their environment on the inside. So that's a nice little play. Now this person's had a go at doing a zebra. If you, I would be encouraging this person that to perhaps to make the zebra a little bit bigger. Oh, but once we're actually framing it, what we could do is, sometimes I just come up with ideas, is when we present, we can just cut off um, a little bit of that space. And even though it's nicely done, you are getting rid of a lot of what the viewer doesn't need to see. So that could be an idea. Now, the other thing I want to show you, and I'm just going to come up a little bit closer for this one, is that the zebra is black and white, but underneath this black and white, they've got their orange wash. And this is what I was saying about really creating a little bit of interest to your work. So please make sure you have a go at your washes. That was good, I walked in and did a little bit of zooming. Okay, here we've got a butterfly. Now, sometimes when you're doing your painting, you gotta be careful what comes in front and what sits behind. So with this person here, they did their orange and then they've done the black and the black really took over the orange. So once they had done, finished the black, they actually did the orange again. So that's something to consider with your work. Now, when you're doing your environment, you want to work from your background to your middle ground to your foreground. So your background is right what's in the back because if you paint something in your foreground and then you go to paint something in your background, odds are your marks will go over the top of it and you just lose that sense of depth. So again, work on your background, your middle ground and your foreground. And don't be shy about um, doing the whole piece because you can dry and it can go over the top of that because sometimes what happens is you paint all these little things and then you spend the whole time working up to the edge. So paint your background, paint your middle ground, and then paint your foreground. It looks, it looks good, have a go. Now this one isn't finished. I think a couple of those are finished, but that's okay. You can see they've really created a sense of pattern with their butterfly. And I think we were going to use paint pens to go over this because you have a lot of detail and a lot of little corners. But this is a really lovely one. Would have been interesting to see where this one goes. And we've got another one here. So you can see the environment that the animal lives in and the pattern on the outside. One of the things you can do as well is once your piece is finished, if you want to outline it, you can do that as well. And that helps separates the pieces and helps with that spatial distance. So, that is your inside-outside painting, which you're very welcome to have a go at.